Howdy, folks, and welcome to the Snowies Camping Show today. Uh, campsite Q and A's, episode number five in terms of Q and A episode episodes number five. That won't confuse anyone. It won't confuse a single person. It's, but it's more like episode ninety. 91, I think. Is the plan. Is the plan. Hopefully that lines up when it's published. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Before we get into the juice of it, don't forget to subscribe wherever you're listening to your podcast, um, be that through YouTube or your podcast app, and also our Facebook group, the Snowy's Camping Group on um, just type in Snowy's Camping, it'll pop up. You'll see it um, with the podcast logo potentially or something along those lines. We keep talking lines. about a name change, we but do. it just keeps getting put in the back burner. So we just have to, we have to just put that little clause in just in case because we don't know exactly when yep. it will change in relation to when these episodes go live. It's so the only Facebook group with the Snowy's logo next to it, unless someone's created a fraud one, in which case it's not us. Yeah. Anyway, let's not um, rant on. The last time we did a Q&A episode was in July, I just right, realised. six months ago. So wow. a really long time. So, mm. um, you know, if you're listening to this sometime in the distant future, it's currently February of the following year. Oh, shivers. No, it's not. It's January. <laughs> I'm pushing the year away already. We're currently in January. This episode will go live in February. It's actually February today. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's the 1st of February today. All right. Just if you're listening, pretend that we're starting afresh from now. So right, We'll put a little clause at the start. If you want to skip all the nonsense, just just go to just uh, whatever part of the video because we're me. trying to work out where we are and what day it is. So... Uh, if you've already listened to a couple of episodes this season, you would know that we've got a bit of a new format um, on our non-interview episodes when it's just Benji and I, and um, we're talking a bit about new gear at the beginning of the episode, mm-hmm. and then we'll go. We've got a funny story at the end of the episode, but new gear. So we mentioned the Picos, I think, in a recent episode as mm-hmm. an awesome inflatable canvas swag, compact, super compact and lightweight. Yeah. So as part of that range. Dometic, who make the Pico, mm. um, Dometic, same Dometic that, that do the, the popular fridges, yeah. have got a range of inflatable tents, which are pretty cool, called San, Santorini. I'm assuming that's how, how you say it, probably, yeah. and just as it's spelt, which are, as far as I'm aware, I haven't actually, we've, we will be doing videos on them. Time yeah, permitting. we will, yep. Um, but from what I gather, it's the same uh, kind of, we say lightweight canvas. Canvas isn't lightweight. It's heavyweight and compared to a lot of other tent fabrics, but it's made mm. of, of canvas and it's got an inflatable frame with what look like quite upright walls and a so bunch of accessories they do, that go with visually, it. Visually, they look a bit like those traditional canvas um, heavy steel pole cabin yeah. style tents. Cabin's they have a, one, a yeah. bit of that vibe, but they're obviously a lot more compact and lightweight mm. um, being air poles, which is cool. Yeah, those old ones were heavy. heavy so much steel heavy. in there. So they were pretty awesome. And we've got some Biolite um, base charge, which is, I think, is that the first time we've seen something like that from Biolite? Like for on our end of things anyway, in terms of they're a, a power station and they come in a couple of different sizes, I think 600 and a, well, 1500? Well, they call it 1500, but it's 1200 yeah. watt. Um, I think it is. I haven't seen any big power packs from base, uh, from, from um, Biolite. Biolite, sorry. They've mm. made compact portable USB, and I guess you could call them large USB power packs, yeah. but not a large like car battery alternative sort of power pack. So these ones are pretty cool. I did um, do the video on the, the 1500, mm-hmm. really intuitive to use, really simple sort of buttons on the front. It's not overly complex yep. and just a really neat, well thought out design. It gives you lots of information on the display. Mm-hmm. Um, Biolite's an awesome company um, uh, involved in a lot of um, sort of works around around the world with Third world countries third, third world, and yes, the electricity and, and yeah. light and cooking and yeah. power supply and stuff. So there's a lot of, lot of good cause behind their brand. Mm-hmm. But these are these are pretty cool. Now, they're not cheap. They're an yeah. expensive item. But um, I think the, exp- the expense is reflected in how easy they are to use. Yeah. And it's early days, but you would hope it also reflects the quality of the battery and the lifetime yeah, yeah. of the product if it's well looked after. And they do a larger panel um, as well that sort of links up with those now too. Yeah, you do kind of end up, as with a lot of these brands, you kind of almost end up in their ecosystem. Yeah. The plugs and stuff all kind of work together. Yeah. And to, to use an alternative panel with this means you need to mess, mess around mess with around adapters bit, yeah. and that sort of thing. But but it's pretty awesome. Check it out. It's on the website now. Um, last but not least, we just got a couple of new hardcore knickknacks, which I really love because obviously doing the van and having a partner who's an electrician, all that sort of jazz, a lot of that power stuff mm. we do ourselves. And anytime there's 
little bits and bobs that come up in that DIY power circuit system thing. Mm. I just love scoping them out. I like hardcore. Yeah, me uh, too. It's got such a range of stuff, and when they bring it out, it seems to be really well thought out and and, and it's neat a, it's very accessible as well. Mm. And that's what I love about it. It's like it's pretty much targeted at every camper to be able to to purchase, and it's not outlandish costs, yeah. but f- what you get for. F- what you're getting for what you're paying for, for value. example, it's great value. It's also um, um, on the flip side of that buy light being caught up in the buy light ecosystem. Hardcore don't do that as such. You generally um, just it, – it's They're pretty general, universal. Anderson plugs, yeah, yeah, cigarette yeah. lighter plugs, yep. those sort of things. There's no sort of hardcore specific wire or adapter that you need. But something that does need to be highlighted is that we now do hardcore DC to DC charges. Mm. We haven't done DC to DC charges before and there's something that – are constantly asked about because for people that have um, the um, the new alternators, basically they're a requirement for running or charging any sort of yep. portable power pack or, or um, 12 volt battery in the back of your car. And it also like gives that. a so better, better charge from solar, definitely a better charge to your battery from your car. Yep. And you can, I think pretty sure, quote me if I'm wrong, but it also enables you to use different battery chemistries within the system, I think. I think it can depending on the actual charges capabilities. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, but they're pretty neat. And cool. those power distribution boxes are pretty cool. They're, they are they're pretty neat, cool. Like really well thought out. We've had one um, from a, I can't think of the brand power something. Power um, tech. Power tech, that's the one. Mm. So they, they're something that you could make yourself, yeah. but they're just really neatly thought out with a voltmeter and, and a heap of USB plugs you, and quick yep. charge USB, USB plugs. USB, I think there's USB-C in there as well, 12-volt yep. outlet, like yep. maybe an ed, like it's just good little sort of switches. Yeah, so cool, check cool, them out. Cool. All on the website now. Right, let's launch into the questions. Questions. So should I go first? Yeah, given sure. It's, given it's Ben from the Facebook group. So we, we put these questions out on a few channels through our, um, well, a few, literally a few, uh, Facebook and, and YouTube. Yep. Um, so Ben from the Facebook group asks, <laughs> I've heard you guys mention scouting a few times. I'm wondering, did you guys grow up in scouting? What kickstarted your love of the outdoors? Are you guys still in or connected to scouting? Um, yes, I was in scouting when I grew up. I uh, did Cub Scouts and Ventures. Um, in a Adelaide Hills here and uh, at the Strathalbyn Scout Group. Uh, I don't know what kickstarted my love in the outdoors. Probably scouting drove it. I mean, we camped a bit as a family when we were young. It was mm. it was basic holidays where we go camp and fish, and wasn't any flash holidays that we went on. But that probably drove the the love of it. And I had a really good group of friends within Scouts that that I I learned heaps in Scouts. It was yeah. a, it was a little kind of family outside of my family. And I am still connected. Um, my oldest daughter goes to a scout group here in Adelaide. Um, it's different now than it was back then. There's a lot more red tape and requirements in the badge say, systems. Yeah. So different. Um, but I, I'm glad that it's still alive and well. Um, I'm still trying to stay part of the group, but my daughter's moved to high school this year and is yep. she's so busy. Different I don't know if she can keep going. But mm. um, but I, I do like to. I have always been connected in some way mm-hmm. to scouting. Yeah. How about you? Uh, I didn't do scouting, no, but I did um, actually do army cadets, which oh, is right. interesting because anybody who knows me now knows that I have a healthy dose of skepticism, skepticism, or whatever <laughs> it's called for authority. It's not yeah. generally yeah, I can't my see vibe. You there. Yeah, yeah. Um, and but through that, we did heaps of sort of jamboree style things and lots and lots of mm. out in the bush survival based stuff, uh, probably yeah. a bit more survival based than scouts in the sense that, you know, obviously being army, army. or military is self, self-sufficiency sort of based stuff, yeah. um, which I really, really loved. But that was sort of more in my early teenage years right. for a couple of years and before that – Ever since I was three, we've been in camping, but real off-grid camping, like middle of the bush, outback stations, New South Wales family, friends, um, you know, um, country family who've been doing that sort of stuff the whole life. And, you know, I've got photos of me when I was literally three and or four and barely walking, just swinging on giant ropes out over the river in my undies and stuff. So it's like I think, yeah, that, that, um, I think maybe like a lot of people growing up, if your family didn't have a huge amount of money or time, yeah. camping was just 
easy. how easy and how yeah. you could just get away. And so, um, you know, I'm not being like, just in case my parents are listening, I'm not like, we were so poor because yeah. that's not what I'm saying at all. It's just more that that style of holiday and adventuring is a lot more accessible for people who don't have buckets of money to throw at yep. Gold Coast holidays or cruises or, you know, that sort yeah, of thing. I'm so, just saying much more uh, accessible. Not It wasn't as busy back then as well. Like nowadays it's, there's more people camping, which yeah. is a good thing, but it means that campsites are fuller and there's more yeah. money involved in going to those places. But like I remember yeah. as a kid we used to go camping in, um, in my dad's yellow um, – Kingswood, oh, yeah. mustard yellow, massive Kingswood, nice. and we'd sleep in like one of those Legionnaire tents, which is, um, you know, the thing I don't know what they call them these like days with like a single just, pole triangle yep, with a single pole like in the, the middle. Traditional, like if you were to draw yeah. a picture of a tent, you'd draw a Legionnaire's tent. Yeah, it's exactly. Got a, a short vertical wall yeah. around the sides, and, and we then, didn't have mattresses. We just yeah. had like thin yoga mats with sheepskins because obviously yeah. Dad's from the farm and they had a heap of sheep, and that's just what we slept on. Yeah, you nice. know, just stuff like that. That's cool. And so, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Next question. I'm going to let you do this one because I think you've done okay. some research behind this. Yeah. So Brad from YouTube. Um, hi, Brad. He has asked us, I have two 120 watt and one 200 watt solar panels. Do I need three MPM, MPPT <laughs> controllers or three charge regulators, basically, or solar controllers, yep. um, as in one for each panel, or can I feed the two 120s through one? and get a separate one for the 200 watt. Well, no, you don't need three. There's one thing to mention. I'm not aware of any um, 12 volt power circuit that allows you to have two M, like two solar charge controllers or charge regulators because the, the battery connected to the battery because the, battery the yeah. purpose of that is obviously to take feedback and readings from the battery to regulate what it's putting through from the solar panels. And mm. if you've got two trying to do that from the battery, it just doesn't work. Yep. That makes sense. And I mean, I'm happy to be wrong, but that's in terms of my understanding there. Well, this so, would be interesting to see if anyone's got other thoughts on this because this is based on our, yeah. our feedback. Yeah. So majority of camping solar panels will usually sit within that 18 to 20 volt range, mm -hmm. right? So I would say for the most part, as long as your panels are within a similar voltage range, there is absolutely no reason why you can't connect all three of your panels together in parallel mm -hmm. and put them through one um, charge controller or MPPT controller to your battery. There's a couple of considerations. One being that you will obviously have two 120 watt panels and your 200 watt panel. Realistically, the voltage is going to be limited by the lowest voltage of those three panels in the chain, right? right? So like if you have one that's 19 and, and two that are 20, then the voltage that's coming through will be 19 volts. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing to consider is that if your 200 watt panels put out, say on average, I think 120 is around seven or eight amps mm -hmm. and the 200 is around 11 amps. That means you've got what quick math 19, 27 amps. So you just need to make sure that the MPPT or any, whatever charge regulator you're using has a capacity of say 30 amps or a yep. capacity that's rated more than the total amps that you should be getting out of your panels. Yep. But and, that, and that's panels connected in parallel, in parallel, which means like they're kind of like piggybacked in a way. Yeah, not, basically not all just, just wide into the one spot. There's they're yeah. kind of in a row, and then that last one is connected to the MPPT controller, which is then connected to the battery. Correct. So if you're using um, like solar blankets, which I'm assuming that Brad might be, he might not be, but I'm assuming he's talking like maybe companion or hardcore type panels. They should all just come with an Anderson connection, and you can all just click them all together yep, and then run them through your MPPT. Add a one into another yep. and then the last one to the MPPT controller. Yep. But uh, keen to hear, usually these sort of questions um, pull out the the 12 volt yeah. nerds or, or geeks and, and we certainly love to hear other people's feedback or setups on I mean, workarounds or, or what doesn't, doesn't work for there. For it's them. possible that the 200 watt may <clears throat> potentially be throttled by the current output of the other two, but I don't think it will be. I think the amps will – add up and the voltage is what will be limited from yeah. the, from those three panels. I wonder if it's a difference in, in the order in which you set them up. No, I don't, I don't know think if that so. makes a difference. I don't think it does. We anyway, haven't tried it, but that's, that that's, our, that's our research. So. Yeah. Um, now, Kate uh, from the Facebook group as well, uh, mm -hmm. my question is more a theme. 
when indeed if ever is the right time to move from a tent to a trailer etc it seems like an inevitable trajectory for many families a uh, trajectory many families are on and i watch and wonder how they make those decisions especially noting cost change in dynamic of the experience etc surely this is a camping equivalent of keeping up with the joneses um that's a very interesting question it is yeah and i think it's um cool that it's been asked for me, a hundred percent, you know, Kate mentions the um the cost and and the dynamic changing dynamic of the experience and all that sort of jazz. And a hundred percent agree with that because, you know, a lot of the time if you're looking at a caravan or a camper trailer, and I mean I was just looking at some came across my radar the other day and I sussed them out. Not that I'm that's in my um I'm not interested in getting one, but you know, if you're getting one new, it's like 50 grand mm. plus. And some caravans I've seen are like a couple of hundred grand and it's absolutely insane. And mm. there's no way that that is even remotely close to mm. achievable for me or anything that I would even consider. So cost is massive, but I think ultimately what it comes down to is how accessible your camping setup makes camping for you. Yep. And I think a lot of families are potentially moving towards that because potentially they, you know, you have your mum and your dad and one of those in your partnership isn't as into camping as another or one of them wants more creature comforts and and things like that. And so you're looking for a solution that means that both parents are going to be as equally happy to go on those kind of holidays. Yep. And I think the other thing sometimes with kids comes down to especially if you've got a bunch of little kids or you've got lots of kids, how easy, you know, maintaining food and water and bathing and getting them to bed and all that sort of stuff is. Yep. Um, for me, my kids have grown up without a huge, not with, not structure. I was going to say without a huge amount of structure. That's not true. But in terms of um, we've grown up with camping and I've grown up with camping and so the idea of maybe not, Get washing for a couple of days mm. or um, having, you know, just washing your armpits and your face or, or you know, eating a can of soup or that real rough and ready camping experience yep. is part of the charm for, for us. Yeah. So we don't need a camping setup that allows us to live close to how we do at home. Mm -hmm. But some, some other people might. Yep. So uh, I agree with that. I think there is a little bit of, uh, like Kate said, keeping up with the Joneses too. New people think oh, I need a camper trailer. Maybe, but consider everything that you've said there and also consider um, for me, like I can see if I had a camper trailer, certainly there'd be elements of camper that you go, wow, this is really easy and comfortable. Mm. Um, but to have that element of ease and comfort, I've got to store that trailer. I've got to spend the money, as you mentioned, yep. on that trailer and register, register it, it and upkeep it. Extra and tires. And I've got to tow yeah. that trailer with me wherever I go And you as need well. a vehicle that's big enough to do that. That's right. And there's nothing wrong with that, but they're all considerations. So I don't think there's a, um, a right – maybe the right time is like how – Exactly what you said. How important is that? And is there an element of what we've currently got that's holding us back from doing what we want? And is, I mean, Kate mentions a trailer. If it's just a trailer in terms of ease of packing, like a box mm -hmm. trailer so you can easily pack your stuff. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of benefits to that because it's easier to pack a trailer than trying to fit it all like a jigsaw in your car. That's and right. It's, and it's, it distributes the weight and makes it safer to, to travel in as well. Yeah. Well, I have friends at tent camp but they're a large family. So they actually do have a box trailer yeah. that sits in their shed and all of their camping gear is in there. So even though it's not a caravan or a camper, they can just hook up their car and go. It's easy, yeah, which makes packing less yeah. daunting as well. So, But, you know, we've got um, Jake who works up here with us in our web team marketing team. He's always been a – Oh, he's like alpine Super lightweight. Alpine lightweight, bike packing. Yep. He's got a couple of young kids now and a partner. And for the first time in his life, he's looking at investing in a small pop top caravan, mm. which he would have never considered himself mm. doing. But he's doing that because he recognizes the needs of his partner in terms of her being able to enjoy the experience. Yep. And that's what's more important. Yeah. But I also do get that vibe of, you know, if you're setting up in a campground and you're sitting there with your tent and your chairs and your table and whatever, and then a big rig rolls in and their camping setup just seems so lush and mm. so much more advanced than yours. But I just, so I think there is that element of maybe feeling like yeah. there are tears of, you know, yeah. maybe elitism in camping or whatever, yeah. but 
I mean, I who cares at, about I, that? You just do what works for you. Don't worry at, about other people. Yeah, I look at the simple setups and I think that's awesome. Yeah, same. <laughs> yeah, I'm a bit the same. So no right time, Kate. Uh, whatever's right for you, I think, to make getting out there easy. Yeah. And if you can afford it, I suppose, yep. is the main thing. Correct. Uh who I did oh your turn. Uh Beth from oh yeah, this question came through via um Q and A's on our website. So we have a a place on our website where people can answer ask questions about products yep. and all that sort of jazz. On our product pages, yeah. Yeah. Um and so Beth's asked this on one of the mattresses that I was looking at. So obviously she's part of the Facebook group because in the Facebook group recently I just ask people's thoughts and opinions of bedding setups and stretches and mattresses and whatever because I need to upgrade. Um, so Beth's asked, did you end up, Lauren, did you end up deciding what to upgrade your kids' bedding systems with? And I have. I'm going to go with um, Xped's Versa mat, a 5R yep. Versa mat. It's essentially, um, it's not self-inflating but it is insulated and you can inflate it within a minute. It's just It's got its pump. integrated pump. Mm. Um, it's long baffles. It's like 10 centimetres thick, super comfy, but it packs down like smaller than a soccer ball basically. It's almost the high, you could use it for hiking. It's probably a heavyweight hiking mat. Yeah, it, it, I think, yeah, I think the Versa is a heavyweight hiking mat. They do mm. an ultra light version mm-hmm. um, and they do ones with more insulation, but – that's what I'm going with and I'm considering coupling it with a stretcher, okay. um, like a super lightweight, low to the ground, yep. packable stretcher, but I want to investigate some more options out there. Oh, the Helinox one, which is quite expensive. The Helinox so one, big... which I'm not going to get because I can't afford four of yeah. those for my children, yeah, but okay. something sort of along those lines, even Zempire do a double U leg stretcher, yeah. but I need to check that out more in person. It's a bit of mucking around setting them up. And so. there was some, yeah, there was some great – um, points made in that discussion in the group as well about mm. if you do go with a stretcher, consider your setup time. You know, if you're moving where you're camping somewhere different every single night, is that something you want to set up? So there's heaps of different things yeah. to consider. But for us, definitely those Versa mats are the ones that I'm going with. Once again, there's no right way to do it. It's what suits yeah. the individual. Correct. Uh, now Lynette, who's a, a regular on our Facebook group, um, is us, I think she fired us a few more questions, but we've, we've – Well, um, these – she gave us a whole bunch of ideas and thoughts that she had okay. on the podcast, which was great, but these were the two questions that All I teased right. out of it. So what camping gear is currently on trend and what is being phased out due to lack of popular demand? Now, I don't have anything immediate in terms of what's on trend. In terms of phasing out, I did think recently that those um, – the, you know, like the speedy black hole tents and there was the Oztent Malamu tents, those those kind of pop-up they ones. They went through a bit down. of a rage, didn't they? They were really popular, yeah, but I don't <laughs> – I, I could be wrong uh, and I'm only going by questions people ask or conversations that occur, not have much around them recently. Yeah. So they seem to be maybe on the way out. Possibly, yeah, because I think in practice they – I mean, in theory, they're a great idea, but in practice, they're a bit less of a great idea because they can be quite awkward to put them yep. back in the bag. They're like a pop-up tent basically, but not like an instant up, a pop-up in the sense that you pull them out the bag and you throw them and they Literally sort of spring up. like the ultimate pop-up kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. like those yep. shower tents that people you see people wrestle yeah. with on the side. Spring-loaded of frame. Yeah, basically. But that's not very good in the wind. Like they're kind of a two-season tent really. They're, they'll keep you dry. They're not super but- strong. They'll keep you dry. Yeah. And I think sometimes if those poles break you can't fix them so i think to a certain extent or you can but it's a diy solution and it takes a bit so i think potentially they're phased out now because the theory was so great but now we're a couple of years down the track and the reality is not so great yeah but i still know people who love them in terms of what's on trend i think it, the so, other thing of phasing out, which I think everybody's probably paid attention to now, is dome tents just don't exist anymore. I don't know why. I don't know why because you can't go wrong. They're so great. You cannot go wrong with a yeah. dome tent. You literally cannot go wrong with a dome tent. I've got one as uh, in my shed that I use as if I've got a family coming along who don't have a tent. It's like that's fine. I have got a four person dome tent. That, it'll see. It's fine for you after. It's easy to put up. They can work it out themselves. Yeah. Got three poles. Cross, cross pole uh, on and the main section. the thing I love about them is if your pole breaks, you just get a replacement pole kit and just fix yeah. them. They're like endlessly fixable. Yeah, not complex, but yeah. Um, I think it's the livability, all the features and functions and the marketing around the other stuff, which does make it good and, and yeah. livable and, and lots of really cool things. But dome tents are ultimately affordable yeah. and easy to set up and solid in the, in the weather. One thing that I do 
think potentially in not too long a time will start to be phased out. And this might be a really big call to make, but is just framed things in general. Like, like I think air, air poles tent. and inflatable things are just becoming more and more prevalent and more brands are getting into like Darchy do one, Oz Tent do one. Like there's so many brands out there yep. that are moving into this area and I'm just wondering how much longer people will be investing in in framed tents. I think, I think you're right. It's probably the you pulled the one thing out that I didn't think of was what with what is on trend. Um, I was going to say um, – like uh, re- renewable products or, or recycled products. We're seeing in a few things and a bit of a move towards more lightweight stuff. Yeah. But I think air poles is probably the big the big trend that we're seeing. There was probably maybe three, four years ago that we sort of first saw them come out and there was a lot of skepti- skep- skepticism, use, skepticism <laughs> yeah. uh, around, oh, my tent's going to go flat. You know, that's no good. But if you think about it, if your tent goes flat, um, you get a hole, you, you, your tent falls down. But all that's damaged is the frame and you can fix that, replace yeah. the ladder. If you've got a steel pole tent or even a fiberglass pole tent, the, pe- the tent pole breaks. Could tear through it's your fabric. Te- and, torn the yeah, fabric. Yeah, yeah. So you've got to repair the pole and the fabric. So, And also air tent frames aren't usually a whole single frame. Is all inflatable sections, in one go? It's yeah. all in sections. So if one bit goes down, it's not like the whole thing's going to yep. fall on you. And they're but now yeah. made with TPU materials. The, the technology is getting better. They're in layers and layers of protective um, material around yeah. the top of it, and they're tested well within excess of what you actually need to inflate to um, put inflate the, the products up. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think, I you're think right. at this stage, the limiting factor, or so far, the limiting factor has been the weight because they do tend to be a fair bit heavier. But I'm wondering if, especially with like the Dometic Santorini's, for example, that we mentioned at the beginning of the episode that are using more lightweight fabrics. I'm wondering if now that inflatable has been established as a legitimate design, the next phase of inflatable camping gear is going to be trying to cut down on that bulk and that weight. Well, I think we're already seeing less protective layers over the frames as we become more confident in the material that the actual bladder frame bladders are made of. I know the Santorini I think just had one or, or two layers, but from memory, I reckon the early um, Black Wolf or even the Outdoor Connection ones off the top of my head, they'd have like three or four layers over the top of the pole to give it protection, yeah. but, which is a lot of bulk over the entire frame. Yeah. Um, now moving on, uh, the second question Lynette has, and I don't really have much feedback on this, but suction or magnetic clip-on awnings any good, pros and cons? I mean, I guess they are good for lightweight campers like Lynette who we know camps out of um, – A little car, Camry or maybe. Or, or Camry or something like that. Yeah, yeah something she camps out of a sedan. Yeah. So big focus on um, – Small, compact, whatever fits in her, her um, sedan. So I imagine a suction or magnetic clip-on awning would be quite compact. Um, I guess my not having used one, my thoughts are how reliable are those suction caps? Because suction caps, there's suction caps and there's suction caps, right? Yeah, yeah. They all tend to pop off after a while in the hot weather or even if they get too cold, they don't stay flexible enough and stay on, so it might That's a really good a point, like variance in temperature mm. and stuff like that. So I'd say they're useful, but I don't know if I'd rely upon them in heavy yeah, weather. But I don't I, have any experience don't, with them. Similarly to you, I don't have a huge amount of experience with them, but I it it would be just, you know, thinking about it on paper, there would be some obvious limitations to them mm. that don't exist with bo- proper like bolt-on awnings and things mm. like that. I'd say that if you are aware of the limitations and you can take into consideration what they are, then they're probably a good option in the sense that, um, you know, if you're having really poor weather, it's going to be super windy, take them down or, you know, just use them for fair weather and, use you them know, for shade. use them yeah. for shade. Like yeah. um, I'm imagining if it's raining heavily and the material gets wet or it's starting to pull the suction cap so the magnets aren't going to be strong enough in yeah. that sort of situation. So they're probably just designed to be quite lightweight, quite compact, fair weather, providing a bit of shade, nothing too crazy. I know um, another regular uh, person in our Facebook group, which I think we've mentioned in the show before as well, but Coralie, yeah. had a, she shared a, a picture of um, oh, yeah, how she's a Fiesta. DIY uh, awning. And I've, I've got one of those Fiesta beach yeah. shoulders and it's a flexible kind of um, lycra type material. Yeah, it's stretchy. And she's just used some of those big um, – 
the, the, you can for the hardware shop, like those big claw clamps. Yeah. And just clamped it to the, the gutter of her, I think it's a high ass fan that she's got, and then just use the poles and set it up like that. So brilliant. I mean, I, I realized I carried a tarp and a fiesta shelter for my entire trip. And then I saw that photo and I went, probably could have done without one of them. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> I was doing the same thing with the tarp, right? Yeah, but, yeah. Um, yeah. But that was I thought that was a great idea. Yeah, yeah. genius idea. Last last question. Before last I, question. Funny story. We didn't mention okay. a funny story at the start. Yeah, I think I did. If you're story still here with us. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah, I did. Right. Um, Joni from Facebook has asked, a removable kitchen in a four-wheel drive boot. I'd like to do this for camping to reduce the setup time as we have a tent, but take it all out when not camping. Is there such a thing? I don't know if there is such a thing. I'm sure you could get someone you, to make something. You could get someone to make something or you could um, actually, uh, what are they called? They're called, I've seen them heaps on Pinterest because obviously I cruise Pinterest all the time because I love ideas that come up on there. <laughs> it's called something like a, there's an actual name for it and there's plans for how to make them. So if mm. you're handy in any way, shape or form, it would be so cool to look into one of these. But they're essentially made out of plywood and they're like a little when it's all folded up and it's a cupboard, but it also includes legs. So you can pull it out of the back of your car oh, I think I have seen and these. the legs swing down and you sort of open up the cupboards and it becomes this big kitchen, but then it all just folds back in on itself. Yep. So something like that might be cool. Um, I know things like drifter kitchens, which people would most commonly know, they mm. might have a super compact option that would suit similarly. Um, but having just built a pullout kitchen for our the back of our Sprinter van, and that wasn't too daunting and it was sort of quite fun. I would say don't be afraid of maybe giving a go at putting something together that that works for you and mm. doing that yourself. Um, I mean, obviously you also have the classic couple of plastic tubs, you know, that you just get you that's a, yep. a fully packed. We've got an episode on that somewhere. It's just fully packed and ready to go. You just whip it out and shake yeah. each other. But that does also require some form of setting up. And I think Joni's sort of talking more about a, a contained all-in-one all kitchen in one, yeah. type thing. I reckon just um, have to consider that it's probably going to be a heavy thing to take in and out of the car. Definitely. And once that's in the car, have a think about what else you need to put in there as well because it'll probably take up a lot more space than tubs. Um, maybe a better option would be um, to have drawers in, in your car so you can pull out a drawer uh, and there's a lot of them that might have a table attached to that that folds out on the end of the drawer so you've yep. got your accessories in the drawer. Look, uh, to, to answer your question, um, to more to the point, Joni, I'd say there's nothing we know of that's specifically available. Certainly ways to build your own and probably companies that could build it. It's all probably restricted by your budget, how much yep. you're willing to cart in and out of the car and how much space you're willing to give up in the back of the car for just your kitchen setup. Yep. And I guess it would also depend, um, removable kitchen, exactly what that means to you. Because for mm. some people that might include plates and cutlery storage and, you know, condiments and all the basics. And for some people that might just be a stove and a saucepan and some cooking utensils. Yep. So, you know, you could get something like, I know 230 do them. They're like kitchen slings. Just fold it out, yeah. And they roll up and you can often roll them up still fully packed with stuff. So, you know, you could possibly even look at something that's a lot smaller that only has a couple of kitchen things but then you've got, you know, your fabric rolls full of the extra kitchen stuff. That would yep. be super easy to pull out as well. Yeah, think about how easy it is to set up, not necessarily attached to the car. It goes yeah. in the car easy, but it's easier to set up outside of my tent under my awning yep. or whatever. Cool. Yeah, good one. Right, it's a funny so story it. time. This is a pretty quick one and it's probably only really going to do it justice if hopefully uh, we're relying entirely on Kira and our editor to be able to put the footage <laughs> in the video. If you're somebody who's watching it, otherwise we'll have a link of where you can watch it yeah, in yeah. our show notes. Uh, yeah, anyone listening is just kind of going to go, oh, it sounds like it would have been good to <laughs> but watch, but funny. thanks, I can't see it while I'm driving yeah, my yeah, car. Yeah, totally. Um, but a uh, <laughs> kangaroo's fighting. At a so, campsite. So Bron Bron <laughs> at a campsite, yeah, that's it. That's our whole story. Um, Bronnie, who works with us upstairs, she does all that yeah. imaging editing. Um, imaging, did I, what did I say? Image editing. She's, yeah, um, image editing, yeah. Shared a video that she found, it was on a news channel or something? Somewhere. She saw it on the news, I think. So some people maybe have seen this and by the time this goes live, you're probably like, guys, that was a couple news. of weeks ago. <laughs> old news. Um, but, yeah, it was a couple of massive roos having a, 
a mad punch punch up up in a (laughs) campground and they just took it straight through someone's tent. And it was a Coleman Instant Up tent. So Coleman yeah. Instant Up, I think 10p North Star it looked Which like. stayed standing. They just kind of went into the side. They but just they ripped did, the whole corner the, down. But I couldn't up. believe it because they literally hit that tent and they were really only on the tent for a couple of seconds before they were up again. Yeah. But the tent was shredded. On the corner. It was on the whole corner. It. it was just sh- hanging in yeah. shreds. And I was just like, holy moly. Yeah. Insane Crazy. damage, but quite funny. Anyway, check out the footage if you're listening. Classic Australian, iconic. Jump, <laughs> jump back in later. And the only better one is that. Have you seen that bloke who punched the kangaroo? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was yeah. even better footage. Sorry if that offends that some people, but that yeah. was also quintessential well, was cool. Australian. Just I love it. Full on there's another kangaroo. one where we're getting on it. We're really getting out of control here. But there's another one I've seen with a kangaroo who chases a poor old fella. Um, de- like obviously he's taking his dog for a walk in the bush or whatever. And it's like a little fluffy Maltese, yeah. and you see on. Security security footage like a kangaroo comes <laughs> bounding out after him and they have this full-on punch up and the poor guy's just trying to save himself and then the kangaroo falls over and he just like jumps on the kangaroo and just sits <laughs> on it and lays that. on it and the ca- kangaroo can't move. I haven't seen oh, that. Oh, man. Awesome. Crack up. Anyway. Uh, anyway, that's us done. I think we're out of time. Yeah. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you again next Monday. See you later.